Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Brent Dodge. Mr. Dodge is a master's in physical therapy. He did his training at the University of Puget Sound. He also has several other certifications, including a board certification in orthopedic clinical therapy. He is also a certified manual physical therapist. Good afternoon, Brent. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for joining us. And today, what I thought we would do is talk a bit about the physical therapist role in the treatment of low back pain. Um, I think we both know that uh, uh, back pain is an epidemic in this country. And I think that, that one of the most useful modalities that we typically use for patients is as soon as we make the diagnosis of what we would call non-specific low back pain, where we've got mechanical back pain or possibly a muscle strain, uh, the first line of treatment is usually send that patient to the physical therapist. So tell us a little bit about when you see that patient as a physical therapist, what's the first thing you do? Well, as with all patients that we see, we're going to perform a clinical evaluation and get a treatment plan together based on what we find. And that's going to include a look at range of motion, strength, uh, double checking any potential neurological findings. We're interested in knowing how the person's functioning because the direction we're going to take is basically helping them understand where the breakdown is in terms of why their back's not working right, try to guide them in terms of the educational process and help them function at their peak. And, and when you see that patient, is there anything that, that I, as a, phys as a physician, can, can do to help, help that patient, one, make that transition to physical therapy, to make it more effective, and also help you as a physical therapist to understand maybe a little bit about what that patient needs? I think from a general standpoint, just helping them connect with the idea that the physical therapist is there to help A with a treatment plan, but also B to be a coach because we know with mechanical or you know what some people call simple back pain, not that it's really simple, that if they have a level of optimism in their practitioner, their outcomes are going to improve. Now, you know, I think that a lot of my patients, uh, when I mention the concept of uh, physical therapy, you know, they, they've come in, they may have their first or second very acute back strain or, or, or back pain episode and they look at me like there's no way I can go you know get on an exercise bike get out there on the treadmill begin doing push-ups jumping jacks I mean that's their concept of physical therapy um, tell me a little bit about that early phase of physical therapy when these patients are are in acute pain and acute spasm I mean is that the time to to get them to the physical therapist is there anything that you can do or should we wait a while I think it's excellent that people are being directed early on. Uh, the, the results that we get when we see people acutely, uh, particularly when we're doing uh, care that includes manipulative therapy, our outcomes are much better because we know from, from studies that if we can help people and get our hands on them and do our treatments as physical therapists, their, their results are going to be better. And that right away gets us, um, we builds rapport to the point that we can then take them down a road that's, that's going to work for them, you know, whether that's a home program, a gym-based program. Um, we really want to tailor a program that works for them. Now, now tell me a little bit. You mentioned manipulative therapy, and I, I think that that may be a term that uh, uh, patients and, and physicians aren't familiar with. I think we all uh, are familiar with chiropractic manipulation. Is this the same type of manipulation, or is this something different? As a physical therapist, the, the tools that I use would be considered physical therapy manipulation. Now, there's basically a, a lot in common with an orthopedic or an osteopathic or even a physical therapist manipulation, but the fact that we're trained as physical therapists to apply uh, specific types of treatment uh, that would be called manipulation, I would keep it in the realm of physical therapy. Now, now tell me a little bit about this manipulation. Um, describe what a manipulation is and, and maybe when it's appropriate to do a manipulation. Well, particularly for acute and even subacute back pain, uh, there's excellent literature that suggests that if a person would undergo a manipulation, now whether that's applied by a physical therapist, chiropractor, osteopathic physician, uh, I would venture to say that those manipulations would be equally effective. There is research that suggests that it's not really about the type of manipulation, it's about when and, and where. 
And so by getting a person early on with back pain and doing a manipulation, simply taking the joints in the low back, in this case, to an end point of movement, and then doing a high velocity, I mean it's very quick, but it's low force or low amplitude to get that joint to stretch. And some people would say, well, shouldn't there be a pop? Not necessarily. Sometimes it's simply a stretching of the tissue. Uh, and the, the results are equally good whether there's a pop or not. And, and what do you think is occurring when you do that, that manipulation? What, what do you think that does to either the anatomy of the lumbar spine or perhaps the physiology of the lumbar spine to make the pain um, I guess lesson. I think of it in terms of, of kind of resetting the nerves in that area, sort of a reboot of the spinal nerve that where, where the location of pain might be. I think there's also a good amount of stretching that goes on which uh, acts as a, what we call a counter irritant that helps to actually override pain uh, and that's through the neurological system. Uh, I think it just through that, that manipulation, you get a lot of relaxation of muscles that automatically then helps people feel better. It gets them moving better. And, and our goal with that is to get them where they can get back to their activities soon rather than later. And a couple of questions. One is, is um, you mentioned that the timing is important. When do you do manipulations? Is this the first thing you do? Is this something down the road uh, during the physical therapy sessions? When? Generally speaking, if it's a, um, a recent occurrence of, of onset of back pain, there's no contraindications, meaning obviously no, no evidence of fracture or um, something you know, like a tumor or something that wouldn't be appropriate to manipulate, uh, the sooner the better. And the research that we've looked at really suggests that within the first three to four weeks is an optimum time to apply that type of treatment and expect even better results that way. Those findings too, by the way, when I do the clinical exam, I'm looking for very specific findings that help me make a decision to do that stretch. So not everybody would, would, would qualify, so to speak, for um, manipulative therapy. That's true, but many do. And, and you would mentioned that they feel better. Is this something that the minute you do this modality, that if, if it works, you're going to have instant pain relief, or is this something that builds up over a few days? The, the results I've seen have been stellar and rather quick in terms of providing a spinal manipulation and having people go, wow, I feel better. And, and that right away is, again, building rapport. It feeds into the whole process of, I'm going to help train you now that you're moving better, how to put that good movement to practice. Now, tell me a couple other things. What would, what would make you not consider manipulation? What are some of the things? Now, now we're assuming that uh, this patient has been evaluated by a physician or you've evaluated the patient. They may have had x-rays or something to confirm that they don't have an infection, a tumor. They may have even had an MRI scan that confirms they don't have a herniated disc or, or anything that we would consider a little more serious, perhaps dangerous with manipulation. What are the things that you're looking for that would, would tend to make you not consider manipulation? Primarily neurological signs and symptoms. Uh, we would say that if there's nerve symptoms such as a radiating uh, pain beyond the knee, uh, symptoms such as numbness, tingling, any, any findings of weakness in, in where the nerves go, we would immediately back off and say this, pro this is probably not a, a good candidate for manipulation. But again, if, if it's borderline, sometimes the manipulation makes all the difference and helps with those symptoms. So it becomes a clinical process of saying, hey, I've got to look at the history, really understand where the patient's coming from, combine that with other clinical findings to say, I, I will or I will not mm -hmm. manipulate. Now, let's move on beyond manipulation for a moment. And let's assume that, that you've either made the decision, this patient is a candidate for manipulation, and you've done that successfully or you've decided that this patient is not necessarily a candidate for manipulation, what's next? I mean, what are you going to do and what sort of a program are you going to set up for this patient in order to try to reduce their symptoms of low back pain and perhaps teach them some things that may help them in the future? Where do you go next? I'm a real believer in helping people understand their condition, but I'm also a believer in helping people feel better. I feel if I can make a, a substantial improvement in the way they feel on visit one, there's a pretty good chance they're going to come back visit two. And part of that is people with, you know, nonspecific low back pain 
from what we're told, will we'll get better 95% of the time within six weeks, no matter what you do or don't do. Um, I have my own opinions on what better is, uh, but I do want to make an impact in terms of how they feel, because then as they start to move and feel better, I can get them confident again in doing their normal activities. And people that get back to normal activities after an episode of nonspecific low back pain, when they do that faster, they recover faster. Okay. And, and we probably should step back a moment and just explain what, what, what this term we're using, nonspecific low back pain. From a physician standpoint, what, what that means is that, that I've, I've looked at the patient, the, the patient has back pain, does not have pain down in the legs, does not have any of the neurological symptoms that you talked about. We may have done an evaluation, done a good history on the patient, um, maybe even have done x-rays, maybe even have done an MRI scan. But at that point, we still cannot tell that patient unequivocally, without a doubt, what is causing their back pain. So it could be a, a host of different things. It could be ligaments, it could be the disc, it could be the joints, it could be the muscles, it could be lots of things that tend to give you the same type pain. And the whole concept of nonspecific is that we're not trying to fool anybody. We don't know where the pain's coming from. Now, interestingly, that in our experience and in the literature, that is a huge segment of the population with back pain. Probably 85% of the people that go through that initial evaluation have nonspecific back pain. In only 15% of the cases can we say, without a doubt, we think that this is what is causing your pain, the so-called pain generator in the back. Now, is that the same concept, I guess is a long question, but is that the same concept that the physical therapist is using to talk about nonspecific low back pain? Well, I would just back up and say that physical therapists have tended to like to name things and to assess to the point that we can say, hey, we think we have a disc problem. We think we have a, a joint problem or a nerve problem. But the reality is, uh, as you mentioned, the, the likelihood that we're on track and have that nailed down is fairly slim. I find it much more relieving to say, we think this might be what's going on, but really what we're dealing with is a back that's not working right. Uh, whether that's through the muscles, you know, they've been confused through a, a pain episode, the joints might be tight, there's a host of things that can happen, and then back there's a lot of structure that can be involved with a mechanical type problem, uh, and I think it's relieving to clients to know, hey, you know, it's not just this specific thing, it's, it maybe is a global problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the disc might be sore, maybe there's a slight annular tear, we can start naming things, but the reality is the back's not working right. It needs some help, and the person needs some coaching to get back to that normal function. Mm -hmm. Now, we've done a lot of talking about movement, about manipulation, about uh, getting back to activities. One of the things that we haven't talked a lot about is what is commonly referred to as modalities. And modalities can include ice packs. It can include heat packs. It can include ultrasound that some physical therapists use. Um, all of these modalities are used for, for pain relief. What's your take on those? I mean, when do you use modalities and which ones do you really like to use and feel like are beneficial and when do you not want to use modalities? In general, because I'm a manual physical therapist, I went through an entire certification process for that, and many therapists that work in orthopedic settings are kind of moving in that direction uh, to embrace a body of knowledge uh, and be able to comp competently use those skills. And so from my standpoint, if the more I can do with my hands early on and get a feel for what's going on, I feel like that, that brings uh, you know, the rapport, it brings a connection with patients. And it helps me as a clinician be able to identify whether I've got muscle spasm, whether I think a joint may be tight or locked up. Uh, but there are times in especially acute situations where you can't do a lot of hands-on. And that's where I find that, particularly ice, I think there's better literature that's, you know, for, for using ice acutely in low back pain than perhaps heat. Uh, I think electrical stimulation is, is a, an effective form of treatment early on. It's not something that we'd use you know, long term necessarily, though it can be applied for chronic problems, what we'd call a TENS ap application. Uh, that's a little bit different than that first you know, early on setting, but 
Electrical stimulation and ice are probably, you know, bread and butter early on in combination with whatever manual things we can do. Even gentle massage combined with that can be helpful. So you're using that for symptom relief. You're trying to reduce the symptoms so that that patient is more comfortable movement with movement, getting back into a normal routine and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's drop back a moment and, and, and look a little bit at the, the, the natural history and the course of physical therapy and what you as a physical therapist are actually trying to accomplish. You mentioned earlier that no matter what you do with these patients, they're gonna get better in six weeks. So why do anything? Why do anything with these patients? What's the rationale? Well, two things. One, I, I, would, I would need to define the word better because I've heard this statement so many times, in fact, read it in the literature today, that people, 95% of people are gonna get better within six weeks. No one stopped really to say, what does better mean? Well, symptomatically, they feel better, so their symptoms are, are reduced or, or gone. But it doesn't explain what's gone on in their body from the, the episode of back pain. And from that standpoint, and particularly as a physical therapist who's looked at a lot of, of um, studies on, on muscle recruitment, we know that even one episode of back pain can impact the way the muscles work. And if the muscles aren't working right, and we tell them, hey, you're better, even, you know, even though their muscles aren't working right, are we doing them a service when we know that nine out of 10 people that have had back pain once will have, have it again, that recurring problem. And it seems to be that there's even a possible relationship there between the episode, the muscles not working right, and a recurring situation. So even though they might be feeling better, I wanna make sure that they're able to recruit the right muscles again and put it into you know, action with exercise, activity, and work. The other part of it is in that first six weeks when somebody is uncomfortable, I think it's a value to be able to help them feel better during that, that first couple weeks so that they can, in fact, speed the healing process so that they can get back to their usual activity, particularly as it relates to work because people that aren't back at work sooner, there, there tends to be some, some potential complications that lead to chronic and disabling problems with back pain. Well, you know, I, I, and I totally agree with that. I think that in our patients, when we um, refer to a physical therapist, one of the things, or the two things that we tell patients are that, one, I'm sending you to a physical therapist because I think it's going to make you feel better, I think it's going to improve your symptoms, and I think it's going to shorten the course of, of this acute back strain. Um, the second thing I tell them is that even if you feel better after the second visit, this is preventative. This is an education. Now, some of them have already had that education, and, and with them, I'm more interested in just the, the symptom relief, perhaps. But I always ask patients if they feel like they've had a good, solid back education program. If they haven't, I'm going to tell them to stick it out for at least a month, maybe six weeks, maybe even two months, to really get that education, um, internalize it, so that the next time this happens, they've got tools to fall back on. And hopefully they'll work uh, in the meantime to try to strengthen uh, the back muscles and that sort of stuff, as you've mentioned, too. I just really appreciate the fact that you, you provide that education because I've seen numerous times where people come in, they haven't gotten the educational piece. We do our treatments and we're successful early on. Those people, hey, I'm feeling good. I don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. And away they go and they show up on the schedule six months later with a recurrent problem. Uh, I, think, I think the fact that you're presenting that to them makes it a little easier for the physical therapist who's sometimes like a car salesman saying, I know I, I can help you feel better, but there's more to back pain than just symptom relief. Right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the duration of physical therapy because I think a lot of patients are a little bit impatient. You know, they start feeling better and they, wanna, they don't want to make those uh, physical therapy appointments. They may not even want to uh, uh, engage in an exercise program. And it takes us a, t you know, it takes... A minimum of three weeks, I guess, is the, is the party line. Three weeks to establish a new routine. So a new habit or something, uh, such as an exercise program, you're going to have to do it for three weeks before you have, even have a breath of a chance to continue it. Um, when you start with a patient, let's say they've had that second or third episode of low back pain, um, the, the phys physician has sent them to the physical therapist. You've got them comfortable, maybe on the first week. How long should they plan on on being in physical therapy, formal physical therapy with a therapist at that point? Is this a, a four week process, an eight week process, a six month process? How long do you think it typically takes? You know, everyone is different. Everyone's learning style and speed may be different. 
I think from a, a very general and broad approach, if I could have four weeks with, with someone to help them through that, that learning curve with two times a week guidance, some people say, well, we should be able to do it in one visit. You know, I know we're good, but I don't know that we're that good because I feel like the added visit a week gives that reinforcement of the educational piece that we're trying to deliver to folks. Uh, but within a month, surely, like you mentioned, you know, the 21-day period where you know, you're, you're creating that habit. But to have that coaching along the way in case something goes awry, there's a, a bit of a flare-up, reviewing the principles of taking care of that. Uh, I would say on average, if I could have four weeks with people, I, I seem to have a good impact and cover the, the curricula mm -hmm. that we want them to, to know. Mm -hmm. and, and what about a patient that you feel like, let, let's say it's one of your patients that two years ago went through that initial program with your clinic. Two years later, they've had a, a new episode of, of low back pain. Do they need to come back and see you? Is there any utility in that? Or should they have the tools to deal with this themselves? Well, I wouldn't want to underestimate the, the problem of low back pain. Uh, I would like to think the people that go through and that we help get better balance in their body, get their muscles working again, provide them educational tools, even tools that they can refer back to in the event of a flare-up would be adequate to help them through a, a potential flare-up. Uh, I know back pain can be troubling to the point they do need some symptomatic relief. Uh, and it's at that time when they come in, boy, we can review things and, and just make sure that they're clear. Because it, hey, if it's been two years, out of sight, out of mind, you know, that's a good time to review. But they've, they've got a foundation and uh, can certainly move, move through that information a little more quickly. Uh, but again, back pain being such a recurring problem, uh, I think that's when they can come back, get the help they need, and they're two steps ahead. And, and what about manipulation at that point? I mean, that, I'm assuming that that still can provide some symptomatic care. So if I'm two years out from my initial episode, of, you know, my back is tweaked again, so to speak, Manipulation can help those people? Oh, indeed. And it, again, for acute onset, whether that's the first episode, a recurring um, episode, those seem to be the ones that, that fit that category the best. Mm -hmm. And we use it most definitely for a recurring problem. A again, I don't know that a manipulation just fixes problems. There are some schools of thought that say, if I could just manipulate this, everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's even some suggestion that if I manipulate, I can get the muscles reactivated and working right. And to, the, to an extent, I've seen literature that supports that. But I think, I think getting that body back in tune and then doing the treatments that help them get back to function would be the piece that they, they can't do on their own, for sure. Okay. This, this has been an incredibly good discussion about what I would say is the most conservative route for the treatment of low back pain. You know, in an age where most people are thinking, gosh, my back's hurting, do I need surgery? Gosh, my back's hurting, do I need an injection or something, or pain pills or whatever? I think that, that what you've just described is the, 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 the most efficient and most effective and probably the least risky approach, at least initially, for most people with nonspecific low back pain. Now, I'm gonna put you on the spot, and. And I'm going to ask you a question because there's been some discussion all over the country about whether or not back pain patients may not be better off directly seeing a physical therapist rather than seeing a physician going to the emergency room um, or anything. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I know there are some countries where that's expected, that a person would go first to a physical therapist. And I think with the educational piece that we've uh, been working through over the last 15 years, I've been in PT now almost 18 years, um, physical therapists are equipped to be able to see somebody, do an assessment and define, is this person right for physical therapy? Or does this person need to see a specialist, a, a, a physician, a chiropractor, somebody that might you know, provide a different level of service? Uh, we know what, what, is, what constitutes an appropriate candidate for PT from a musculoskeletal standpoint, meaning there's not a tumor, there's not a fracture, these kinds of things. We can rule that out and make a determination that this person's at the right place right now. And I, I happen to work in a setting where there's 4,000 members of a fitness facility that walk in my door and have direct access to me, and I need to be able to know 
Is that a sport injury? Is that overuse? Is that simple back pain? Or is there more going on here? And not be hesitant to say, I need you to go see your doctor before we can implement physical therapy. Do you think that in this country, in the foreseeable future, we will see um, the physical therapist becoming uh, what we would consider a primary care practitioner that actually has that direct access as, a, as, a, as just a, um, a, a matter of course? Well, I know more and more states are going to a direct access model, and it largely becomes uh, a matter of our educational piece, where now uh, nearly all physical therapy schools have moved to a doctoral program and specifically are, are implementing educational pieces on you know, clearing people of red flags, making sure that they're appropriate. So I think that, that leads to the next logical piece. Yes, we're the practitioner of choice for particularly simple back pain. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you know, that becomes something that insurances, insurance companies will pay for, some are. And I think there's a benefit because people can get right in. They don't need to wait around. They can get the care they need. And they, knowing what guidelines are available for physical therapists and for physical therapists that know how to classify people, we can go right in and get the right treatment quickly, get them on a treatment plan, and uh, see good results. Well, I think that we've covered just about everything that I had hoped we would cover during this discussion. Is there anything that you think patients should know that we have not covered tonight? I think there is. Uh, one of the pieces of our examination um, that may not make sense to clients is, why are you putting me through a movement assessment when I don't really feel like I have that pain, like my symptoms are gone now? Why would you want to assess my body? And from my perspective, uh, particularly working with athletes and, and specifically golfers, we put them through a rigorous movement assessment. They think they don't have pain, but we find areas where there's uh, joints or muscles that aren't working right. Now, not, it, it won't necessarily require manipulation, but based on the movement screen, we can know, hey, this is tight, this is weak, um, this is imbalanced, and, and that will further direct care to make sure that they're back in balance so that this recurring problem uh, doesn't affect them or hopefully doesn't affect them. So I think patients find it strange when we're putting through a, a movement assessment and one movement doesn't hurt, but yet we key in on that because it may be affecting something that otherwise was painful. Mm. Uh, for example, somebody may have pain, you know, right at the end of back bending, they arch their back and they feel pain. But then I watch them, they can't touch their toes and I think, okay, not everybody has to be able to touch their toes, but I want to see a reasonable semblance of flexibility through the low back, the hips, and the hamstring muscles. And as soon as I start treating the dysfunctional movement, the one that wasn't necessarily painful, a lot of times then they can go back into extension and they don't have pain. So, so we're back to that, that, that point about being that physical therapy is not just about reducing symptoms. Exactly. It's preventative and you have to key into those things and really stick to it to, to have some long-term impact. And we're really back to a, health, a wellness model, a, a model of trying to optimize function and reduce pain in that way rather than just sort of focus on when you have pain. Right, and it's, it's totally true with our, our athletic you know, folks because they wanna perform better. Sometimes it isn't a matter of pain, but can you look at my body and tell me how to perform better? Well, a lot of times we're picking up movement problems that we can then address through hands-on treatment, manipulation, a home exercise program, specific exercise they can carry out at their gym, uh, and they, they re not only feel better, they perform better. Well, this was an excellent discussion, and, and I really appreciate you coming by and clarifying um, the role of the physical therapist and really giving patients excellent information on how to access physical therapy and what to expect. Thank excellent. you. Excellent. Thanks for having me.